this image is easily recognizable as a human brain, but this is a simplified color-coded version. The actual human brain is a little messier and looks like this. A huge amount is devoted to the cerebral cortex, which is most of what you can see when you look at an intact human brain. Upon first glance, it doesn't appear to have much in the way of organization. If you compare it to a street map of Edmonton, there certainly doesn't appear to be a lot of urban planning going on in the cortex. However, the cortex has been mapped and described in astonishing detail. At this point, the picture is still far from complete, but neuroscientists continue to piece it together. For this tricky topic, we'll consider the arrangement of structures and connections in the cortex. Before diving in, it's first helpful to consider where this human cortex came from. Some evidence for the origins of the human brain comes from comparisons to our early ancestors. Over on the far right is a skull of Sahelanthropus chidensis, which lived between 6 to 7 million years ago. Some argue this species might be our earliest ancestor. Although their skulls resemble chimpanzees and their brains are estimated to be only a quarter of the size of modern humans, they share some anatomical features that suggest they walked upright. A later human ancestor is Australopithecus afarensis, who lived in Africa from 2 to 4 million years ago. The most famous member of this species is Lucy, a female whose remarkably intact remains survived until discovery in 1974. Her brain was a little larger than Sahelanthropus, about one-third the size of the modern human. Homo erectus, who hung around on Earth for a million and a half years or so, had an estimated brain capacity much larger than Lucy's. The more modern Homo neanderthalensis, the species that most people think about when they picture cavemen, had a very large brain. Neanderthal skulls differed from other early humans in that they had a prominent ridge on the forehead, shown here. The brains of modern humans, Homo sapiens, are actually thought to be a little bit smaller than those of Neanderthals, but are amongst the largest of the hominids. Homo sapiens' behavior is responsible for our biological success. We can choose to wear a hijab and drink a coffee while taking a selfie. Other animals don't do these things. The flexibility and adaptability of human behavior is driven by our large, unique brains. We can only estimate what the brains of our relatives looked like, because we have remains of skulls, not actual neural tissue. We can get some sense about the anatomy and function of the human brain by comparing to other living species. At first glance, this rat brain on the far right looks much smoother than the chimpanzee and human brains, which appear more folded and wrinkly. This folding allows a large amount of brain to be scrunched together into a small space. You can see how this works for yourself if you take a sheet of paper and crumple it up. More brain folding is thought to represent more brain matter. Primates, like humans and chimps shown here, have large brains with lots of folding in the cortex, and this is thought to underlie some of the fundamental differences in thought and behavior. Let's take a peek inside the human brain. Neuroscientists have been able to piece together an overall organization of the brain, as shown in this cross-section. This organization roughly divides the brain into three main regions, the hindbrain, just above the spinal cord, the midbrain in the middle, and the forebrain at the top. Clearly, most of the brain is forebrain, and most of that is cortex a structure that makes up about 80% of the human brain. Because the human cortex is so highly folded, it resembles a pile of worms. However, the word cortex actually means bark in Latin, since it covers the rest of the brain just like bark covers a tree. So what does the cortex do? The cortex is responsible for all sorts of complex thought processes, like perception, decision-making, and language. Let's take a look at the human cortex in more detail. The cortex is made up of two hemispheres, left and right. We're looking at the left hemisphere right now, but if we rotate the brain, we can see that the right hemisphere is the same size and shape. Each hemisphere has four lobes. The very front is the frontal lobe, behind it the parietal lobe, in the back is the occipital lobe, and near the temple, resembling the thumb of a boxing glove, is the temporal lobe. Of course, a real brain is not color-coded, but it's still possible to identify these general areas. Just looking at the cortex and its arrangement doesn't necessarily tell us what each of these areas actually do. Figuring out the functional divisions of the cortex requires different strategies. There are three main functional divisions of the cortex, 
primary sensory areas are the first bit of cortex that receive incoming information from our sensory organs. There is a primary sensory area in the cortex for each of our senses, and most of this is relayed through the thalamus, which sort of acts like a switchboard. These primary sensory areas are important for categorizing and integrating sensory information, which are the first steps in conscious perception. The primary motor area is a strip of cortex at the posterior, or back end of the frontal lobe. It receives information from surrounding areas and initiates a motor plan for voluntary movement by communicating with motor neurons in the brainstem and spinal cord. Association cortex, which makes up most of the cortical volume, has a less well-defined job description. It integrates information gathered from other areas to regulate complex thought processes such as problem-solving, decision-making, and language. Unlike the primary sensory and motor areas, Electrical stimulation of association cortex does not produce movement or sensation. For this reason, it is sometimes referred to as silent cortex. Now you might be thinking, under what circumstances would somebody sign up to have their brain stimulated in the first place? Well, that's a good question, and the answer is that it happens in unusual circumstances. Some medical procedures have allowed neurosurgeons to take a really intimate peek inside the brain. From the 1930s to the 1950s, neuroscientist and neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield made incredibly detailed observations from awake, locally anesthetized patients undergoing surgery for epilepsy. Penfield tickled the neurons with a mild electric current, and the patient then reported their sensations and movements, which were recorded and mapped. When Penfield stimulated the brain along the strip of cortex shown in red, his patients reported movement on the opposite side of the body. When he stimulated the strip shown in green, they reported sensations of touch, again on the opposite side. These careful observations allowed him to map the primary motor cortex and primary somatosensory cortex. Somato means body, so somatosensory is a fancy term for body sense or touch. With repeated stimulation over many patients, Penfield noticed that the arrangement of body parts in these strips of cortex is the same as in the body itself, with the feet at one end and the head at the other but for the opposite or contralateral side of the body. If we take a slice from the primary motor area from one hemisphere, you can see that the body map in the cortex is the same as in the actual body, with the feet at one end and the head at the other. If we look at the somatosensory cortex right next door, we can see a similar body map for touch. Note the disproportionate representation of some body parts, like the hands and face. For instance, the fingers take up a lot of space compared to the legs. So the amount of brain devoted to a body part depends upon its function rather than its physical size. We have much finer motor control of the muscles in our fingers compared to our legs, so the fingers get more real estate in the motor cortex. The same is true for touch sensitivity of these body parts, so they take up more of the somatosensory cortex. Some organs, such as the teeth, gums, and genitals, have representation in the somatosensory map, but not the motor map. Of course, these areas have extreme touch sensitivity but not much in the way of motor control. Penfield stimulation experiments reveal the organization of the motor and touch maps in incredible detail, but opportunities for this type of research study are rare. Another way scientists learn about functions of the cortex is by making observations of people who have sustained some sort of damage, usually through disease or injury. This image outlines what happened to 25-year-old Phineas Gage, an American railroad construction foreman who suffered from an accident in 1848 in which a tamping iron, used to compact explosives into holes drilled in rock, set off a spark causing an explosion that sent the tamping iron through his head. He sustained extensive damage to his frontal lobes, especially his prefrontal cortex. After he recovered from the initial trauma, he showed profound behavioral changes and he became impulsive, impatient, and disrespectful, using profanity which is unlike him before the accident. He lost his job because the railroad felt he could no longer perform his duties. This is one of the most famous case studies of brain injury, and since then research has pointed to the frontal cortex, especially the prefrontal cortex, as being particularly important in planning and impulse control. With these early attempts, as well as more modern and less invasive techniques such as neuroimaging, scientists have been able to localize certain functional areas of the cortex to particular anatomical locations. As we learned from Phineas Gage, the frontal lobe is involved in attention, planning, and impulse control, and has a large role in voluntary movement, since it houses the primary motor area, 
The parietal is involved in sensation and perception of touch, since it's here you can find the primary somatosensory area. The occipital lobe in the back is strongly tied to vision and houses the primary visual cortex. The temporal lobe has a strong role in hearing and is the location of the primary auditory cortex, which receives incoming information about sounds. Keep in mind that this is a brief description of cortical anatomy and does not include all of the functions of the cortex. In fact, we're still learning about it.